All right, I, I, got, a, I got a philosophical question for you. Uh, do you love your job? I, I got to say, sometimes I get bogged down in the mire and uh, get caught up in some of the, the stuff that we do. Um, but I, I'll tell you, I, I'm doing this conference next week. It's in front of 9,000 high school students. Uh, I've done it the last two years. I'm doing it for the third time this year. And I have to tell you, the, it is so rewarding. It is so rewarding. First of all, you, they, they make you feel like a rock star up there. But second of all, they remind me how lucky, how fortunate we are to do what we do. I mean, we, just even the fact of like, you think about trying to get into college and then wondering if you're gonna get into medical school and then wondering if you're gonna get into residency and then getting a job afterward. And all these things we kind of take for granted now. And I certainly do. And then when I start thinking about that, I get the opportunity to take care of a cardiac arrest. I get to take care of somebody in their greatest need. This is, I mean, it's just so cool what we get to do. And so I, I bring this up because we're going to talk about some minutia. I mean, serious minutia of resuscitation. You're going you're gonna to be like, Zach, you are asking me to stand in a particular place in the room? Like, this may sound like things that are so mundane, but I'm going to tell you it has outcome differences. And so we're going to talk about the ergonomics of resuscitation. Really, this is more about how to run a code. Okay? Our story goes back to the same guy, Ec first ECMO survivor. It took us how many minutes? 69 minutes, right, to get this guy on the pump. And after we did that, and after our first other survivors after that, we realized, man, it's easy to fake a code for 20 minutes. But when you're doing it for 69 minutes, you, you start thinking, man, am I doing this right? How can we do this better? And I, asked, I got asked to give one of my first big talks, and it was up in Seattle, and it was for Harborview, for their residents and for their Medic One program. And I went up there to teach them how to run a cardiac arrest, and I realized that I was the one getting taught, that these medics were running cardiac arrests on the streets of Seattle in the rain better than I was running them in our ED. And it kind of ticked me off. It kind of made me think, like, wait, how can this be? How can we let these medics run this in a more organized fashion than we do in our ER? So we went back. We started to reassess. We started thinking of ways that we could improve our cardiac arrest. And we came up with some initial schematics on where we thought people should stand and where we thought people should go. And we started thinking about some of the things that are problems with cardiac arrest. And probably the biggest one is that they are intrinsically chaotic, right? They are intrinsically chaotic. Unless you do something different, they are going to be chaotic. And the other problem is that they are just infrequent enough that you can't build on one after the other after the other. And the final thing here is that each of these positions that real estate, real estate around a cardiac arrest, whether you're in the field, whether you're in a wide open room, or when you're in a small ER room, is tight and expensive. And so we took these things and we said, okay, unless we start planning for how to run a cardiac arrest, we are going to be caught up in the same mire day after day after day. Each of our arrests will be essentially the same. So what do we do? We thought of some general concepts. We thought of some things that universally we can take home as this would be improvement in process. And the first thing was we wanted to limit the number of people in the room, right? More people is not better. More people is not better. And this goes into the second thing, which is that those people that are in the room, we want them to do the same thing every single time. We want the person that stands at the right upper part of the bed to do the same thing this arrest, the next arrest, and the rest after that. It leads to an environment where you understand that person's job is to do this. This person's job is to do this. And the last thing that we thought is we need to educate our entire team. 
the entire number of people that are going to be in that room, they need to understand what we're looking for. What are the metrics that we're trying to attain? What are the things that we hold as the ultimate priority of these resuscitation? So I'm going to spend a little bit of time in what we educated our team on because it might not be so evident what we found as being the most important things. There are three things. The three things are generate CPP, defibrillate well, and diagnose cardiac arrest. Now this is not in your ACLS algorithms, right? You don't see those, those three concepts in ACLS. They are there kind of superficially, but once you get to the idea that this is what we're looking for, then everybody on the team can try and do the same thing that you're doing. So the first thing here is generate CPP. Most of the world thinks when we are trying to generate chest compression, we're trying to utilize chest compressions, we're trying to pump blood through the heart. That's actually not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is we're trying to pump blood through the coronary arteries, right? We want to generate coronary artery perfusion pressure. And however we do that, however we do that is beneficial. Norm Paradis did the classic trial. Very simple, simple graph here. If you get CPP, if you get blood to flow through the coronaries, a lot of people come back. A lot of people get return of spontaneous circulation. And more importantly, if you don't, they don't come back. Nobody gets return of spontaneous circulation. So somehow, you have to meet this threshold. You have to get more than 25 millimeters of mercury of CPP in order to even give them the chance to get return of spontaneous circulation. So how do we do this? We do this primarily through chest compressions. And one of the things, I'm sure you've heard this, is that minimizing interruptions is one of the key factors to generate coronary perfusion. Why? Because each time we interrupt, each time we stop chest compressions, that CPP falls off and it takes us quite a while to get it back up to that threshold. So interruptions are a problem. We need to minimize them. And particularly, we need to minimize these interruptions right around defibrillation. This is called peri-shock pause. Sheldon Cheskis did some of the definitive work on this. He showed that if you had good chest compressions, if you minimized your peri-shock pause, that you were 1.8 times more likely to get return of spontaneous circulation. These are impressive numbers. So how do you do this? Well, we have talked in, in the past about hands-on defibrillation, doing chest compressions right through defibrillation, right? Few people got shocked. Maybe that's not such a good idea. So we don't say that anymore. But, we'll, but the concept is the same. The concept is that if you're using manual chest compressions, that you can time this. You can have this, the person that's doing this in the room doing compressions. OK, we're shocking in three, two, one. Hands up, shock, hands right back down. Minimize the peri shock pause. <coughs> This leads into mechanical chest compressions. We've all kind of been aware of these, but what's the data say on mechanical chest compression devices? Well, there were three big trials, all device-sponsored uh, trials, which showed mm, about the same. And then in real-world practice, it came out. Scott Youngquist did a great paper from Utah where he had his medics do this. And the odds ratios were lower with the use of these devices. They were lower in overall, and they were lower in the EMS witnessed patients. The patients were most interested in these devices had poor outcomes. Now, there's a lot of factors that could be related to this, and particularly in Scott's trial, he, he is the first one to admit that. There was another big trial out of Japan that showed these, the odds ratios, were in favor of manual compressions. Why would that be? Why would manual compressions do better than mechanical chest compressions? Well, the truth is we're pretty good. We're actually pretty good. We're better than we think at assessing where the pressure needs to go, where the vector needs to be driven. And all of these studies are all in patients who got good chest compressions, right? They had good manual chest compressions. And so as humans, we actually do a good job on this. And so that might be one of the factors. There's a number of other smaller factors that we can think about. But the real question is, Zach, do you use mechanical chest compression devices? 
And the answer is, I do. I do. Why do I use it? Well, there's one comparison here that we haven't talked about, and that is transport of patients. If we're going to start talking about changing the paradigm of cardiac arrest, the only way we can do that is to get patients to the ER. There might be some pre-hospital interventions that we can do eventually, but as of right now, for us in our in resuscitation center idea, we need to get them to the hospital. And in my opinion, it's not safe for a medic to do chest compressions in a moving rig going lights and sirens. So we need these devices even to get them to the hospital. You should be comparing 100% mortality to whatever mortality you would get with a mechanical device. This leads into the second component of why I like these is that it's far easier to cannulate. It's far easier to get an A-line in intra-rest if you have mechanical chest compressions versus manual. The onus is on us, though, when we use these devices to make sure that they don't cause harm. And one of the re things that can happen with harm is by the movement of these devices. They can easily move up on your chest. They can easily move down into your abdomen. And if we are in the mindset of set it and forget it, damage can occur. You need to be on these devices making sure that they are actually generating CPP during your arrest. In the future, in the not too uh, distant future, we're going to have vector-driven mechanical chest compression devices, and this actually may be the whole difference, that the idea that you can actually change the dynamics during the arrest on where the compliance of the chest lies and where the maximum CPP can be generated through chest compression. All right, so that's number one. Number two, defibrillate like a pro. I got to play this video because I like it. Everybody makes mistakes, even doctors. I forgot to say clear. All right, defibrillate like a pro. Most of us know how to defibrillate. Hopefully, you've never blown somebody up. If there was one number, though, that I would have you remember from defibrillation, it's this 95%. 95%. You need to defibrillate 95% of the VF patient in order to successfully get them out. Why? Because if you only defibrillate part of the heart, the VF comes back, right? Shortly, very shortly thereafter, it comes back. So 95% of the heart you need to get, and this means that you need to understand the vectors, you need to understand where the current is going, you need to understand where the pad placement is. This should be a priority of you in your team play, because most often the person that's putting on the pads is the least experienced person in the room, right? We used to say this 10 years ago, the least experienced person in the room was the person doing chest compressions, right? And then we started changing that mantra. Now we have high quality chest compressions. Well, now the mantra is switched to make sure that those pads are on the patient correctly. Do I care about AL versus AP, anterior lateral, anterior posterior? I don't really care. I actually don't care. I just don't want the pads to be way down low or way up high because defibrillation of the pectoralis major muscle just isn't terribly effective. Okay, so be on that. Have somebody be on that. And this is where teaching your team the idea of 95% that you need to get that heart, most of that heart defibrillated in order to successfully convert them. Having your team members educated about that relieves you of the responsibility to do that during the arrest. You can trust them to do these during the arrest. All right, so this is the next concept. And I want to, this is maybe a little bit more details, but I think this is interesting stuff. So when you think about defibrillation, we have this idea of, dual, or of um, biphasic defibrillation. But in biphasic defibrillation, there is an important advancement in addition to the fact that the electricity goes back and forth and it involves impedance. You know that the amount of electricity from big hairy guy versus skinny guy is different the amount of electricity needed to go through that heart. And in the transition from biphasic, from monophasic to biphasic, this was one of the advancements they put in there, is that instead of just sending electricity back and forth, it sends a small amount of current initially, which measures that impedance, and then varies the electricity given. There's even advancements in these biphasic defibrillators to try and keep using capacitors to have the electricity in that kind of money range, in the area where we are going to have maximum defibrillation, minimizing the amount of scarring, and, and, but also getting above the threshold to actively defibrillate. So biphasic defibrillators, point here is that they're very good. They're very good. 
but we need to utilize them well. We need to think about how we can use that defibrillator to maximize our chance of getting someone out of VF. And the patient that I want you to, to take home from this is that patient that you're just about to call them refractory VF. Refractory VF. Before those words come out of your mouth, I want you to think, how did I use my defibrillator the best to convert them? Meaning, did I think about their impedance? Maybe this patient is way too sweaty. Maybe the pads aren't getting, getting stuck on the patient correctly. Maybe the patient is not, um, uh, <clears throat> maybe we're not actually getting their 95% of the heart. Some of these patients that have a cardiac arrest, guess what? They have big hearts. They have cardiomyopathies. The bulk of their heart might be in a different place. We know that the apex of the heart has a substantial amount of the mass of the heart. And so think about that when you're looking at patients on whether maybe even adjusting your pads might get them out of VF. Um, we'll talk a little bit about dual sequential. I'm just going to spend a second on this because I think this is an important concept. The idea is that you put two pads on or two sets of defibrillators on, you can potentially increase the amount of heart that you defibrillate. Now, usually this is not getting the same amount of joules at the same time. It's very difficult for someone to get the push the pads, the push the two defibrillators at the exact same time to make this happen. But by converting part of the heart and then converting the other part of the heart that you missed just after your first shot, you could potentially increase your yield. Now, some of these studies, like this one, show exactly that. They show, wow, patient number one got shock, 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 shock. Put them on dual sequential, they get out of it. Number two, failure. Number three, success. Success, failure, success. So a lot of these people who had refractory VF improved with dual sequential defibrillation. It would be really nice if that's what all the literature showed. Unfortunately, there are two other trials out there which did not show that dual sequential defibrillation improved outcomes. Now, I, my argument on those two trials in Toronto and Texas is that they were sicker patients. The patients who were placed in the dual sequential group were actually uh, much sicker than the ones that were in the traditional group. And so we are going to have actually quite a bit more data on dual sequential defibrillation in the next few years because there are multiple groups working on this right now. All right, moving on. Last one here as far as education of your team is diagnose cardiac arrest. What do we mean by diagnose cardiac arrest? Well, let's be honest. A lot of cardiac arrests are diagnosed with this, the digitometer, right? And guess what? The digitometer is not terribly effective at diagnosing cardiac arrest. We know it's not terribly sensitive. It's not specific. When you're trying to feel for a pulse, you're just not that good. And the worst part of it all, is that it takes us forever to do it. We're maximizing interruptions with our pulse checks. And so what can we do in 2018 that minimizes our use of the digitometer? Well, it is with the ultrasound. And cardiac echo is very effective at deciding whether someone is actually having a cardiac arrest or whether they're in profound shock. This brings up the concept of pseudo-PEA. The idea that someone has cardiac activity, but I just can't feel a pulse. And this study here, Norm Paradis did, she told us the ills of doing this, of getting chest compressions in someone who still has active heartbeat. The problem here is that you have as likely a chance as pushing down on the heart when it's trying to fill as you do with doing the beneficial aspect of this. So he said, hey, this could be problematic. And there were a couple trials. First one was out of Slovenia, which I thought was amazing. And then whoever did this trial, the Reason trial, uh, if you're in the audience, I'd love to buy you a drink sometime because this was a great study. It said that in these patients, these patients that had organized cardiac activity, if we, instead of doing chest compressions, simply gave them pressors, gave them adrenergic stimulation, they did better. They did better. Does that make sense? Conceptually, does that make sense? If you have someone that's actually in profound shock, chest compressions can potentially be deleterious to them. All right, so that's how we educated our team. 
So what happened? What happened at our small community hospital where we have no residents, no mid-levels, we just have our team? Well, we started practicing. And we started practicing with small groups of people. We started running codes together. We started educating our team. And we came up with this schematic. And this is the one that we still use today. We put everybody in a specific place. We have the physician. We have the nurse. We actually utilize two nurses and two physicians in our ideal setup. And each person has their place and has their role. So our ideal resuscitation team, just like most of you, I'm working in a community hospital, it involves two docs, two nurses, and two techs. Now, I'm sure some of you have, do not have the ability to have two docs. That's fine. In fact, if I had to choose, it would be less people versus more people. We have sometimes we use these added people to help us if we have a pharmacist or an RT or an extra runner. And then later on, we bring an ECMO RN. But these are the people that are allowed in the room when we run our cardiac arrest. I'm going to mention just a couple of people here. There is uh, the code, nurse code team leader is probably our biggest change. This is the biggest change that we did and had so many downstream effects uh, beneficial to our department. But what we did is we started empowering our nurses to run our codes. That's right. We have our nurses run the code. Why? They're better at it. They're better at it than us. Because what they do is they minimize interruptions. Because who causes interruptions? I do. Just give me one more look at this ET tube. Just let me have one more look with the ultrasound machine. Just give me a couple more seconds to put this central line in. We cause interruptions having someone outside the code that's watching and managing it that can minimize interruptions is key. They also do the most important thing that I mentioned in my last talk, and that is shock VF. We can't forget to shock VF. Having someone in ventricular fibrillation getting not on a monitor or for whatever reason we get so bogged into the code we forget to shock, that's a problem. The last thing that they do is they get the ISTAT so that we can determine the potassium. So we have our nurses lead our codes. As stated, this, the nurse actually has, because of this, they've actually become super more involved. And we tend to, you know, on some of these cardiac arrests that have been down for more than an hour, we will walk them right through the ER when they walk out of the hospital. And we have our nurses who feel much, much more involved now that they feel like they ran the code. And so this has had downstream effects in our ER, not just from a cardiac arrest standpoint, but from an efficiency standpoint, from a feeling of like, I am working in this department to help people. This has had multiple beneficial effects for us. All right, second person I'm going to talk to you about is the alpha doc. This is the doc that, that we traditionally associate with the code. What we try and do with that doc is have them do one procedure. They intubate. After they intubate, their entire job is to be cognitively available. The idea here is that we want to have them have as much brain power associated with the arrest and not be in the arrest. So they go talk to the family, talk to the medics, decide whether they're an ECMO patient, decide if there's something that's extrinsic to what we're doing that may benefit this patient. The primary doc's job is to be cognitively available. Last person here I'm going to mention is the wire assistant. The wire assistant is someone that we did not, we did not appreciate until just maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Having someone that helps you with placement of these lines, someone that can predict what you're doing is so useful. So how many of you have put central lines in like this? You take the needle off, and then you lose the line. You lose the line. They're getting chest compressions. You go over there to get your wire, and then all of a sudden, I lost it. The interest A line is that times 10. Having a wire assistant that can be there just like this video to put that wire in as soon as you get that flash increases success. I mean, we haven't quantified this, but you can just tell. I mean, it exponentially increases our first pass success. When you start talking about the success of interest A lines, if you can get it on that first poke, so much easier. 
After you get one poke in there and you missed it, you got the hematoma, it becomes really, really tough. So wire assistant is our third job that we have found very useful. Art lines, like I said, I love them for all sorts of different reasons. They help us manage our patient. They let, for, for pseudo PEA, they can actually determine for you whether you are having benefit from chest compressions or not, right? You can see right in front of you, is their map going up because I'm pushing on the chest or is it staying the same? All right, so our outcomes. In our hospital, before we started this, our survival, uh, out of hospital cardiac arrest survival was 13%. We then started doing all of our ECMO and, our, and uh, these other initiatives, and we started doing this. We started putting these empowering nurses, running our codes differently, organizing our codes, and our cardiac arrest survival went up to four, 24%. And we say, well, that must be all the ECMO that you did. You saved all these patients from ECMO. Well, actually, that year, we did three cases of ECMO, and one of them survived. It changed our survival almost nothing. The real improvement from survival was the fact that we organized our resuscitation. We focused on the minutia. We empowered people to be educated so they knew what we were trying to do during our cardiac arrest. Problems we've encountered, this is the same problem that happens with every intervention. If you're not on it, you will fade back to your old culture. And we've had that at times. We've fallen back into our bad habits. We've had lack of leadership in our codes from our nurses. We've had physicians trying to take over. And what we need to do in these scenarios is we have to go back to the basics, go back to the teaching. And we found that by setting a time, if you have a known cardiac arrest coming in from the field, to set up a time right before the patient gets there of who's got each job. Okay, you're the nurse code team leader. Your job is to run the arrest. You're the alpha doc. Your job is to think about the code. Okay, you're the line doc. Your job is to put in the lines in the groin. You are the wire assistant. Your job is to make sure that that wire goes in as quickly as possible. These things, by defining roles before the patient gets there, leads you to success during your code. Take home points. Organization and resuscitation is important. Number two, do the same thing in the same place every time. Helps out. And then the last thing is maintain cognitive availability. And with those three things, I hope you run your resuscitations that much better next time. Thank you.